the first idea was like, let's do these toothpaste tablets. You would bite them, you chew on them, and then you start brushing. And we're like, it's not that big of a change in behavior. You know, like it foams up, you still use your toothbrush. So to me, and certainly my co-founder, we're like, oh yeah, this is like no brainer. Why wouldn't everyone do the switch for the environment? We pressed enough to give out a set of 14 tablets to 50 friends and have them use it for a week. And the ultimate question at the end is, would you switch? At the end of it, like over 75% of people said they wouldn't switch. Thank goodness, you know, like we paused and we stopped and we asked that question. And I certainly could justify myself. I'm like, why wouldn't people do this for the planet, right? It's the same experience. It can be just as effective. But a lot of people were like, it's just weird. Like, I don't want to chew this tablet. I don't want the powder in my mouth. This is Start at the Storefront. Today's guest is Sarah Paiji, co-founder of Blueland, a company that makes eco-friendly cleaning products. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. By now, I'd guess that most of us know that single-use plastics are cluttering our landfills. Sarah's solution was to eliminate the plastic bottles that cleaning supplies come in by offering tablets that dissolve in water. Buy one bottle and keep it for life, restocking on the tablets as needed. And if that seems like a good idea to you, you're not alone. As she made that pitch on the TV show Shark Tank, and got a bite from none other than Mr. Wonderful himself, Kevin O'Leary. So listen in as we cover everything from the lessons she learned in starting a multitude of other companies prior to Blueland, why she monitors all of the company's social media accounts, and what it's like behind the scenes for entrepreneurs before and after the camera's roll on Shark Tank. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have the wonderful Blue Land Company, and here we have CEO Sarah. Sarah, thanks for joining us today from from New York, right? Yeah, from New York City. Thanks for having me. So, for people listening, I've, we've done some research. Blue Land. How do you explain it to people? What's the quick, high level, the quick sixty second pitch? Uh, what does the company do? Yeah, yeah. So, so Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single use plastic packaging, and we're starting with cleaning products. Um, So our first set of products come as a system of refillable, reusable bottles um, and a set of cleaning tablets. And how it works is that you simply fill up one of our bottles with warm water. You can drop in a tablet. It takes just a few minutes to dissolve. It, It starts bubbling and effervescing on its own. And at the end of a few minutes, you have a full bottle of cleaning solution or hand soap. And so the products that we offer today are a foaming hand soap, a multi-surface cleaner, a glass and mirror cleaner, and a bathroom cleaner. The beauty of the tablet also is that obviously they come packaged in compostable paper instead of a plastic bottle. How did the idea originate? Where did it come from? Uh, we, we, so it's funny, we, we know some people on, on one of the podcasts we had, there was a, it's so an MIT mechanical engineer. What they did was they found a way to, dis, they used the polymer, right? To desalinate effectively water. And they realize that there might be a money-making application for it as it relates to alcohol. And so what they're trying to do is literally take beer. So beer, if you think about it, 98%, 96% water, something like that. And when it's being transported on a bus, really these, these, these cargos are just spending millions of dollars on, on literally shipping water. And so they're trying to make beer a concentrate. Um, very difficult to do because of the taste. But the idea was there, right? And so when I saw Blue Line, I thought, this is, this is so amazing. Very similar concept, a lot of complexities into it. And so how did you guys arrive just at like the, the first step of like, what was the hypothesis you were testing at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the initial idea for Blue Land um, came about completely organically. It, it actually didn't come about from, despite my co-founder and I both being serial entrepreneurs, it, it didn't come about as like a search for like an idea or a startup. I had just had my son, I gave birth, I, I breastfed him for 11 months, which was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And yeah, and then I was finally switching him over to baby formula, which was like a really big move for me. And so at that point, a baby formula typically is powder mixed with water. And at that point, I was doing a lot of research into what kind of water I should use, drinking water I should use to make this baby formula. And I was actually even open to like, is bottled water safer than tap water? And in that process, I was pretty horrified to learn that regardless of tap or bottled water, like drinking water generally contains like hundreds of pieces of microplastics. And that's when I started to make the connection that all this plastic we're consuming as a society is ending up in our waterways and our oceans where it's breaking down to these tiny pieces um, that's now showing back up in the water I was using for my son's baby formula. And that was kind of like the wake up call for me as just a consumer to 
try to cut back on my own plastic consumption or my single use plastic consumption. And that really opened my eyes to how it was just so hard to avoid, you know, whether you go to Target or CVS, it's just aisles of everything seems to come packaged in single use plastic. And so I felt like, hey, I have the startup background, you know, I could have so much more impact beyond my own personal consumption if I could figure out a way to give people more choice and ended up landing on cleaning products to start just because, you know, you look at those spray cleaners, you look at like a Windex or multi-surface cleaner, and it's very obviously like mostly water. And so it just didn't make sense, um, like you were saying, for a consumer to go out and like be like lugging this water home to pay for water that you already have at home. Um, And similarly to like, throw away and buy a new plastic bottle each time when plastic was really designed to last forever. So yeah, that's how the initial idea for, for Blue Land initially came about. So you, you mentioned that you and your co-founder were serial entrepreneurs before starting Blue Land. What was your background? What other companies had you both started? Uh, my co-founder, John, he has a more traditional CPG background. He um, launched and eventually sold Uh, a great brand that's still around today called Bundle Organics. It is a juice and tea brand for nursing and pregnant women because when you're um, pregnant or you're nursing, you can't have any um, juice that's not pasteurized. And so he had like a flash pasteurized juice and he had, you know, nationwide distribution at Target, Bye Bye Baby, Babies R Us, et cetera. Um, As for myself, uh, I started my entrepreneurial journey about 10 years ago. My first startup was a mobile shopping app called Snapbet. It was a location-based app that helped you help shoppers find products in stores around them. You know, I kind of launched that at the height of the excitement around mobile apps and social. Actually, interestingly, it was before Instagram existed, if you can imagine a world pre-Instagram. And Instagram launched shortly thereafter. But, you know, definitely a good first foray into startups. And that was venture-backed, grew that team to about... 15 folks and ultimately sold it to a large e-commerce shopping search engine called Price Grabber uh, about three and a half years uh, into the business. After that, you know, I had a one year lockup with my full team at the parent company, but I knew that, you know, I had made so many mistakes as a first time founder. I was just kind of itching to get back into the early stage company building game again. And at that point, I reconnected with some friends from the e-com space that had launched and sold Rulala, which was one of the early flash sale sites. And uh, we had this thesis that it was still, it was 2013, it was still early innings of direct to consumer. And we believed that categories would continue to move um, direct to consumer. And at that point, like Warby Parker was like the big example. Um, So we raised some money and set the goal for ourselves to launch one new business per year in the space. And that's what we did. So over the next four years, we launched MGemi, which is direct-to-consumer luxury footwear. Then we launched Rockets of Awesome, which is direct-to-consumer um, kids' clothing subscription box. Um, and then we launched Full Lane. We launched Full Lane Digitally, which is a clean beauty retailer. Uh, and then Trade, which is a, a coffee marketplace, was the last um, business that I launched with Launch um, and, you know, those businesses are all still thriving today. And yeah, that's kind of when I ended up, you know, having my son and having this epiphany. Also, you know, having my son, I did decide to take take some time off from the startup studio. It had been a pretty grueling, almost like seven years at that point with my first startup and then launching four more (laughs) startups. And I think that I realized that I still really love early stage company building, but to justify like how much of my time and life it took away, like I had to find more meaning in my work. And that's kind of when the idea for Blue Land all came about. I love that. I love the honesty of that. That's kind of the the whole point of our podcast is inspiring entrepreneurship through the truth, right? And I think there's so many entrepreneurs who they hear just that, that classic rainbow story where it's like idea and then pot of gold. And that sounds so great, but the, the most important colors of that rainbow is passion, right? It's like you have to really care about what you're doing or else someone's going to either take your company or you're just going to fail. And, and a fortunate reality is you've hired a lot of people that depend on that company. And it's just kind of, um, it's tough. It's a tough realization. So that's, that's really awesome that you did that. And it's, and it's a long journey. So I think, I think a lot of people, you know, go into it hoping it's going to be like an in and out. But I think it's like, it could be like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like, you know, the next like seven to 10 years of your life. And so you want to make sure it's in a space or a product that you're, you're passionate about. 
Yeah, so it sounds like you had a you had a pretty good idea though. You had obviously you had experience, and so you knew not to sort of wait where to waste your time. And you had a team in place. What was the first thing that you did? Was it was it just prototype for a while? What was kind of like the the very first few things, the test markets? Maybe give us a look into that. Yeah, the the most important thing for us was really to validate the idea and the concept and make sure that you know we were building a product and a business really for a much larger market than ourselves and it's hard to be i think honest with yourself that i've i have the pattern recognition now of having you know launched a lot of companies where you know definitely you as the founder really want you know this thing to be successful and to you it's like such a no-brainer idea like why wouldn't people want to do this um yeah. but you need to really really make sure that other people also you know want this product or need this you know product or service and so yeah we just did a lot of very low-fi low-cost time-consuming user testing early on um so Actually, the cleaning products was the second product concept that we came up with. The first concept was actually toothpaste tablets, which is now a product that is that has like more awareness. But you know, about two and a half years ago, that was like a product that like no one had ever heard of or conceived of. And the idea of toothpaste, the reason why I was so passionate about toothpaste was that toothpaste tubes are like an aluminum plastic blend, so they're impossible to recycle. So like literally like every toothpaste tube we've ever used like still exists today. And wow. that was crazy to me because at least like with the cleaning spray bottles, like you can still like recycle those um, even though, you know, recycling may not be happening everywhere as effectively. But in theory, you can still recycle them. But, you know, toothpaste tubes, you just can't. And so the first idea was like, let's do these toothpaste tablets. You would bite them, you chew on them, and then you start brushing. And then when you start brushing, it starts foaming up. And we're like, it's not that big of a change in behavior, you know, like. It foams up, you still use your toothbrush, except it starts as a tablet. So to me, and certainly my co-founder, we were like, oh yeah, this is like no brainer. Why wouldn't everyone do the switch for the environment? And so we learned to make toothpaste tablets in our kitchen. We pressed enough to um, give out a set of 14 tablets to 50 friends and have them use it for a week straight, morning and night. And we ended up checking in with them every two days to see how they felt about the product. And the ultimate question at the end is, would you switch? And very interestingly so, and painfully so, at the end of it, like over 75% of people said they wouldn't switch. And, you know, there was the writing on the wall and thank goodness, you know, like we paused and we stopped and we asked that question versus like going and sourcing and manufacturer and ingredients and packaging and like, you know, it, it's, it, I think it's very easy to just like kind of go off to the races. And I certainly could justify myself. I'm like, why wouldn't people do this for the planet, right? It's the same experience. It can be just as effective. But a lot of people are like, it's just weird. Like, I don't want this tablet. I don't want to chew this tablet. I don't want the powder in my mouth. And so, I love that you did that. I think yeah. so many entrepreneurs, it's another thing, right? It's like, that's the thing that a seasoned person knows. It's like, don't assume you know anything. Go out to the market. Ask the market. Don't. Mm-hmm. Because your your bias, even as good as you might think you are at anything, that bias is going to come through in the way you ask the question. Just like blindly give it away and get the feedback. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, to your point, you could spend six to seven years, you know, literally pushing a boulder uphill for nothing. Literally, because because what you realize you're trying to do is change human behavior, which is the most unsustainable (laughs) business model. Very difficult to do. At what point did you guys go into launching, like raising money? Yeah, yeah. So um, we bootstrapped for a while. Actually, we bootstrapped probably for a little over our first year. But, you know, a lot of that was like, you know, testing different product concepts. You know, we we certainly want to make sure that this cleaning product that we want to make was is actually doable. And that answer wasn't clear for a very long time because it just simply wasn't something that had been done before. So you couldn't just go out and be like, oh, sure, like it exists. So we could, you know, we're just going to put a cool brand on it and sell it online. So it's going to be doable you know, we quickly realized that we would have to, like no one could just off the shelf do this for us. Like we'd have to find a chemist who would formulate it. And then we'd have to find a manufacturer that could manufacture it. And so it wasn't until we had a prototype that worked well, um, that we then had the confidence and we had the consumer research behind it as well, that this was a product that people were interested. It wasn't until then that we decided to go um, raise money. And was it friends and family mostly at the beginning or was it was it straight to venture capital firms? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we went broadly. I was assuming that it would have to be, you know, friends and family potentially to start, given that 
Um, we were looking to raise capital before actually launching the brand, um, which is unique. I think, you know, for most companies, even I would recommend like launch, have some metrics and then go go fundraise. Right. But because we had so much R&D and because there was just like equipment that we would actually need to buy because the stuff wasn't being done, like we couldn't just go to a contract manufacturer who would have it all set up for us. We did have like, pretty high capital needs. And so, you know, ended up launching a pretty broad process. I'm a believer in that. I feel like if you're going to fundraise, you know, like momentum is really important. So it's like, I don't think you should dribble it. I think you should like just go out strong, talk to as many people as you can, like try to get that momentum going. And so went broadly. I think I was fortunate that, you know, having been in the startup space for a while, I had a had a good network of folks to go out to. Yeah, that's super important. And then obviously you guys made a debut on national television with Shark Tank. What was that process like for you guys? Was it normal, straightforward? It looked pretty cool. I, I watched the clip. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was it was insane. Uh, it was a lot. It was the furthest thing from straightforward. Like I feel like I grew up in entrepreneurship alongside Shark Tank because Shark Tank's been around for about eleven years now, and that's like right around when like my interest in startups initially peaked. And I've like I really don't watch any TV, but probably the one of the few things that if it's on, I'll like kind of watch is Shark Tank. And so I think in the back of my mind, it's always been like, I've always said it to my friends, like I want to go on Shark Tank one day, like half jokingly, half real. Um, none of my startups historically have been a good fit for it because of the price point or, or something else. And so, you know, I think very early Blue Land days, I was like, oh my God, we have to go on Shark Tank. You know, the price point is so right. It's the $2 tablets, it really is a mass market price point. Yeah, and just with our mission, like, you know, the mission for us to like maximize our environmental impact, we just want to get, you know, in as many households in America as possible. And yeah, we just went through the straight, like we went through the traditional process that's on their website. You know, we made it a submission video. Uh, so it, the whole thing is pretty time consuming because you have to, like we probably put together a, like a 10 to 15 minute, minute video to submit. And then, you know, you go through several rounds and there's just like, like literally hundreds of pages of paperwork that you have to fill out. You like fill out these essays, like applying to college. Um, they do extensive background checks, you know, et cetera. And then it's not over till it's over. Like you can go to LA, you can film and still, I believe like half of people don't ultimately air. And so yeah. like every, like, and then even LA, I think we were out in LA for like 10 days in a hotel room, kind of like waiting around. And obviously there's a lot of practice that goes. And that's all on you guys, right? The travel and everything. Okay. Yeah. And that's all on us and every step of the way. Like even once you get to LA, you know, you may not film, you know, even if you film, you may not air. And so you know, there's definitely a lot of questions like, is this the best use of our time? But it just felt like I continue to believe Shark Tank is probably the most valuable, like organic pieces of like marketing or PR out there that's still available. And so for sure, television yeah. in general. Totally. Yeah. What was the prep process like? Did you know ahead of time which judges would be there? And did you research any of them to know their tendencies and whatnot? So we did, ex we, like, I guess my mantra in life is like, I always come prepared. And so I think I ended up watching like every single episode of Shark Tank. That's like, wow. ever, like literally, I think I watched like all 11 seasons. We didn't know who the judges were until the day before. And so we kind of had to like really research all of the folks that could potentially be there. You know, it was all hands on deck. And at that point, I think we were like a seven person team. Um, and three of us were in LA, two of us were going on air, but pretty much for probably seven days, like every day, the whole team was on, like just grilling, grilling us with questions on Google Hangouts. Was it a bit of a yeah. battle to, to see who would come, go on television with you? Or was it was it pretty uh, clear? People were like, you guys are really good at this. It's just you two. Oh, no, I think, no, for us, I think it was, um, we ended up bringing on our scientist, uh, our head of formulation. It was part of like, the routine we wanted to do, we wanted to like lean into the science and like the like a wacky scientist thing, but he was probably going to be the best counterpart to me to like if there were any extreme like questions that I wasn't going to be able to answer. I've always been curious. The the deal that is struck on the big screen is that the same deal that's struck behind the scenes, or are there changes made to that after the fact? I mean, it's all really up for grabs because I think what happens on the set right like as you see it on tv like the terms are very 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 general and so there's just a lot of you know in the weeds that you don't sort out and so you know there's there's still you know a lot of other discussion to be had sort of after you walk off the set 
And did the investors from uh, that ultimately bought in, did they have a lot of say going forward, a lot of input, or did they kind of stay in the background? What was their role after the fact? Yeah, so we've been we've been really fortunate. Um, so we ended up doing a deal with Kevin O'Leary, who did not expect to be the one we did the deal with, um, especially because he's very valuation and multiples focused. Um, we went on Shark Tank just one month after we launched, so we didn't have much of a track record or revenue to show for. But you know, he ended up being intrigued, and I think I say we're lucky because he's been. He's been just a great balance of like being supportive and being like very reachable, but you know, not, not like getting in in our way. And so um, it really has just been upside for us. He's been really good about. He's on TV probably about once a week. So he's really good about like name dropping us when he can. You know, looking out for opportunities for me to go on TV with him. Um, he brought us onto QVC like one week after Shark Tank aired. I was on QVC with him, um, and then after that, I ended up going on QVC like five or six more times. So it's been, it's been great. Like we text all the time. We get on the phone. It's he's been shockingly accessible. Mister Wonderful. He's yeah. holding up to it's his name. It's great to hear. <laughs> So the question I've always wondered is, so as you're raising like your series A, or at least thinking about that, right? So what is it like having Shark Tank? Do, do the VCs like it? Are they kind of like, oh, that's cute. That's great for marketing. Or, you know, what what is the general feeling there? Yeah, I think the general feeling has been like net positive for sure. I think there's been a good track record of companies that have been able to take that platform and that exposure and really, you know, build off of that in a strong way. So like Love Pop is one, you know, Plated certainly is is another. And so generally it's been viewed as positive. I think they want to see that it's it's not just a blip in revenue, but you know, we've been fortunate we've been able to have, you know, each subsequent month be higher than than that month and really like build upon that again that momentum and that brand awareness. And outside of that success in terms of the marketing, right? In terms of TV and that exposure, what types of other marketing campaigns are you guys running? Are you like influencer heavy, very Instagram focused? What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so for us, honestly, in a lot of ways, you know, we are pretty limited in terms of what, you know, marketing channels are available to us just because our price points are lower. Um, you know, like a spray bottle and a tablet's about $12. The tablets themselves are $2. And so it's interesting. I mean, as if I were to do it by the books in terms of like what I learned in entrepreneurship to date, I always thought I would only be in high order value and high LTV businesses because in my mind, I was like, oh, that's how you're able to afford the marketing, right? Like, and with MGemi, it was like $300 shoes. The average customer bought three or four times a year, right? Or you think about Casper. So it's interesting to be in this, you know, world of like low average order values and, and lower LTVs. But I think because of that, it's definitely introduced a lot of discipline. And so, you know, we don't do a lot of spend in areas that we can't measure very well. And so we're actually doing um, really no paid influencer activations um, at the moment. Yeah. You know, we lean in heavily on organic Instagram. And so like, you know, I myself am very hands-on with Instagram, uh, which is, is, is interesting for a lot of people to hear. And even for myself, I think very early days, I thought that was like the first thing that we were going to offload and we were going to find some like, you know, young, hip, like in the know, you know, person with, you know, a good eye and a good voice and have them like take that off my plate. And then I realized that it's just, it's such an important pulse of our end consumer and that, you know, it was really important for me to see. So I still get notifications on like every comment that made every DM that comes in, I see. And while I'm not like necessarily reading each one in detail or responsible for necessarily replying to everyone. Um, I think that definitely comes through. Totally. You can totally hear the feedback on your products. Were people confused about what are they excited about? Like in what tone is that coming through? And so, yeah, that in like every Instagram post, I'm, I'm very involved with, um, if not the one posting and writing the caption. And I think, you know, it's, it's paid off. Like we've hit, I think we're at 121,000 followers. Um, we're just 10 months in, which is exciting. It definitely is a huge, huge source of our new customer acquisition, uh, which I'm really proud to say because I think, you know, historically with the other companies that have been involved with paid channels have been the major levers for growth. So it's exciting to be a, in a business that, you know, where you truly have this organic momentum. Um, but outside of that, you know, we do, you know, run some amount of Instagram and Facebook ads, you know, Google search, and we're actually doing a small amount of TV commercials as, as well. That's great. Great idea. Are you leaning into digital advertising during this time just because a lot of the stores are closed and, and obviously it's a great time for your your, your on, online sales to go up? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I would love to be leaning more into digital marketing right now. Um, the cost per impressions have certainly come down quite a bit. Um, the thing with us is actually we're inventory constrained at the moment, just because there's been the surge in demand. You know, we we make our inventory bets like months in advance, and again, trying to remain disciplined as much as we could rush and like airship things over, then like all of a sudden we're losing money on the margin side, and so um, we're kind of sticking to just selling you know, what it is that we have available, you know, doing everything we can to try to get things in a bit faster, but not, not paying up. So I'm curious, right? So what does the data tell you in terms of like how often people actually clean their homes? <laughs> like, right. You see the reorder. So you're like, wow, up? this person, yeah. this person maybe once up. a year. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It really does vary, which is the crazy thing. And we see that in the reorders and we see that we hear that anecdotally from people as well. Uh, and because people also ask us the question of like, you know, they come to us as like, how many tablets should I order? And we're like, well, how often, how often do you clean your bathroom? And, you know, you'll hear everything from like once every couple of months. And you're like, oh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then you have, you know, you have people that are doing like light cleaning, like constantly, like throughout the day. Right. Um, and we're hearing that even more. It's interesting um, just hearing the Instagram chatter because I think a lot of people are home now and they're just finding themselves cleaning more because they're just in and around it um so it, it definitely it definitely varies quite a bit um but for sure i think you know like the families are you know our our best sort of customers to the extent that they're you know living in bigger spaces and with with messy children and just cleaning a lot a lot more often. all the time yeah. how much effort do you guys put into like just the awareness of it and so just the, like the reducing consumption as it relates to plastics and things like that i, I just always wonder from a consumer perspective like there's this thing where a lot of people say like, oh, made in the USA, we want everything made in America. But when it comes to them buying it, they really don't care. The data suggests that it doesn't matter. And so when it when it comes to you guys and thinking about how you market, does that resonate or are people just sort of learning now that that matters? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we it definitely is the leading message for us only because that's like if i were to be honest like that's the only differentiator right if you were just looking for effective cleaning products there's good stuff out there if you're just looking for cheap cleaning products they're good there's good stuff out there um but for us it's it is the holistic message of like plastic free you know is, is the big box that we check that other people don't offer but on top of that you know we really lean into our products are just as effective as the leading comparable brands. We have, you know, standardized studies at third-party labs that can confirm that. It's a money-saving product, so it's only $2 a tablet. Um, so by your second refill pack, you're actually um, saving money versus the conventional product, which is a very powerful message for a lot of people. And, you know, space saving is is another one where definitely for, like, the urban consumer in tight spaces and certainly periods like this where people are stocking up on, like, hand soap and cleaners. Like, you know, we have people buying, like, 12, you know, 24 bottles worth of stuff. But, you know, the package that they're getting is, like, you know, this this small and they could just, like, slip it in their in their drawer. So, yeah, we're leading with plastic, but we definitely need to, like, you know, mention all of the other propositions. And, you know, the visuals, I think, also help for us as well. The, the bottles, you know, we certainly have tried to make them beautiful and differentiated and sort of give that additional emotional pull to to make the switch. We're, we're investors in an almond milk company. And for them, they they sell, you know, we get the frozen packets. And then we just get the bottle. And so all we're really doing is putting the frozen packet in the bottle, adding water and then shaking it. And then that's usually good for seven days. And then with the beer company, right, the desalination and, and talking to Ronan. And I'm just like, this is certainly a trend. There's something moving towards, I almost want to say it's easier, right? It's not, it's environmentally friendly. It checks that box, but it's certainly from a consumer perspective, easier. And when I think about COVID-19 and just like what happens in shopping and leaving your home, all of this kind of solves that, right? And so it's almost, to me, it's like, is the economy at an inflection point around consumer awareness on this type of product? And to me, the result, it seems that way, right? I, there's signals in the market. From your perspective, as someone who's been in it way longer than me, where does your mind go on that? Do you think for sure tablets are going to go, we've won, that we've hit it, now's the time? You know, what is, what is that like for you? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think in a lot of ways, I think it, 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 this period has kind of cut both ways for us. I do, I do continue to be very confident when I look at the tablet um, or this tablet form factor. It is one that's here to stay and it's going to have longevity. Like when I think about hand soap, like it just, and that's where I, like for us, we've taken a more conservative approach as a startup because I feel like 
this will only fail if we shoot ourselves in the foot because I do believe like it does not make sense for people to be like buying and carrying around and shipping around all this liquid. I also understand it's not necessarily for everybody, right? And there is still this element of you having to make it. Um, but I do think, you know, this period has, you know, increased the value prop in people's head of how convenient this form factor is. Um, and we, we get also a lot of comments on that too. Like people are thankful that cleaning sprays or soap isn't the other thing that they're trying to lug home from the grocery store right now among all the, like the, the, when they're trying to do like a month's worth of shopping. All the toilet paper. Yeah, exactly. The other area that I think is still out and i'm not sure how it's going to cut is that i think last year and early this year there was so much incredible momentum behind climate change and plastic pollution i think it was very much so top of mind for people i think everything that greta was doing and um, as well as it just continued like being a hot topic in the media and social media was great and that definitely was a tailwind that we were feeling as a brand Um, understandably i think given everything that's going on right now like i think those issues have definitely taken a back seat And so, you know, certainly my hope is that people do continue to realize that, you know, climate change is, you know, very much, you know, still a crisis, um, though just not the one right in front of our faces at the moment. But it will be interesting to see if, you know, that that hopefully is able to get back to where where that once was. I was going to ask if this has filtered into any other aspects of your life with, you know, you you start this company that's all focused on being eco friendly. Have you noticed that you've started looking at other areas in your life that could uh, either have used improvement or things that you just didn't even notice before? I mean, I would say that it definitely has highlighted how difficult it is for people that don't necessarily have access. I think there's definitely been this trend on the coast and in New York, New York, Brooklyn, SF, certainly around like a zero waste movement. And it's, you know, it's a lifestyle that I've tried to live to the best of my ability for the past two years. You know, I think the past two weeks, right, I've consumed so much product in single-use plastic. You know, I've had so much shipped to me. And I think, um, again, it just really highlights that if when farmers markets aren't open, right, or you don't have access to bulk bins or, you know, these other things that aren't sort of universally available or you may not universally be affordable that, you know, We have to understand that, you know, different places, different people will be at different places in in their journey to do sort of what they can. And where can people find you? Lastly, name the website, everywhere else, your personal stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, people can find our products on blueland.com and follow us on Instagram at blueland. Uh, You can also follow me at uh, spyji, S-P-A-I-J-I. Spygy, I will follow you. Thank you so much. Look, it's been great. I hope everything is going well. This has been awesome. Yeah, Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. This is really fun. Thanks, guys.